Okay, is this picking up my mic a little bit? Okay, hopefully that's working. Oh, oh. Okay. All right. Time to dust off the cobwebs. We were talking about these magical things called AVL trees. They are trees that are self-balancing. This is a question that is very similar to the one on your exercise three. Here is a number, insert it into the AVL tree, and then write the final form of the AVL tree after whatever magic happens in that self-balancing sort of structure. Also, I'm sorry, I have no idea why the Slido QR code would not work today, but I only have the link and the ID for you. So go ahead, take a few minutes, talk to the folks around you, remember how AVL trees work, and we'll come back together in like three minutes or so and chat about this. All right, I'm gonna pop over to the Slido, maybe see what the answers are looking like. If you haven't had a chance to take a guess, I'm sorry the QR code's not there. I hear y'all actually really do use the QR code, which is amazing to me. Okay, let's, let's see how many of you have managed to find your way to the Slido. Oh, 100 of you, okay, cool, okay, great. We'll let a few more trickle in. So the question is, what node is six's parent after all of the self-balancing magic happens? So uh, looks like, oh, we've got a few more answers coming in. I'm gonna click the show results. Let's see what's happening. Oh, okay. All right, so if we look at our options, we see that we're, our options are 4, 8, 9, 16, and we are going to place the value 6. So let's walk through this bit by bit. So when I am going to add a new node to an AVL tree, where is the 6 initially going to go? before I do any sort of self-balancing rotation work? Where do I first put it in the tree? Yeah. To the right of four. So what happens is, right now, we are going to remember, start with that BST invariant, and we're gonna place the node to maintain that sort of sorted structure, and then we're gonna do a bunch of fancy flipping of uh, pointers and stuff like that, to get to a balanced state. So it follows the BST pattern where we come in and we look at overall root and we're like six, less than or greater than 16. It's less than, so I whoop, 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 travel to the left. And then I ask myself that same question. It's less than eight, so I go boop, I travel to the left. And then I say, oh, it's greater than two, boop, I travel to the right until I get to four. And then I am going to place my node. So every time I initially place a node in an AVL tree, it will be a leaf node. Because that's kind of like the easiest place to pop something into a tree, right? Like, it would be really hard for me to sort of like make a bunch of space and then like inject it into a branch node or something. I kind of like to think of it as like hanging in a little extra ornament on the end of the tree. And then we do a bunch of rotations, something like that. Whatever uh, non-denominational analogy works for your non-Western centric uh, situation there. But uh, we are going to pop it off of the um, to the right of four because it's greater than four but less than eight. And then once I do that, can anyone raise their hand and tell me at which node does that cause an imbalance? Which node then becomes imbalanced? Yes. Yeah, you're, you're right, yes, two. Two becomes imbalanced because 
Imagine we have our little six, and let's see how good. Oh, thanks. Thanks, past Casey. That is the animation I wanted. Um, so we pop it in here. And remember, the way that we measure balance is we are going to compare every single node's left and right subtrees, and they can have a difference in height of at most one. So when it's here, two's left subtree, which is non-existent, has a height of negative one, that's our like non-existent height, and its right subtree has a height of zero. Like there's a node there, but it's a leaf node, and so the difference between negative one and zero, one, that's cool, it's balanced. But once I add in that six, the height of two's right subtree then becomes one. And the difference between one and negative one is two, too big, imbalanced. If the math stuff is annoying to you, you can also look at it and you can see that line case that we sort of chatted about before appear. So in this type of line case where we have three all in a row going one direction, in this case we have three all sort of leaning to the right, what type of rotation am I going to do? Does anybody know? Anyone remember? Yeah, help us out. We are going to do a left hand rotation. If I'm leaning to the right, I'm going to counterbalance it with a left rotation. So this is what's going to happen. We're going to do a little rotation. If you remember my little animation, I kind of think of like a hand coming in and grabbing this four and then sort of like pulling the four up and that force of pulling the four up kind of pushes the two down gravity wise. And that gives us this nice little sort of triangle, which is a nice resolution in height to the line. So uh, I agree with the 70 something percent of you that said four would remain its uh, parent because we're just doing one rotation in this situation. If instead I ended up in the other case, the kink case, where I have to do two rotations, I probably would have a different parent than where I initially started there. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh, counterclockwise instead of left. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, the reason we call it left is because we do have this sort of concept of left and right children, and we're counteracting a line to the right. But if it helps, like, and I really appreciated like all the hand waving, like everyone's like pointing, and then I saw a little like this gesture happening, um, because that is kind of what's happening, right? Is like I'm going to take this four and I'm going to pull it up. So the four that was previously to the right of the two, it kind of comes on top and the two then kind of gets pushed down. So it's sort of like the two and the four sort of counterclockwise rotate, but it's really like that four, that four kind of rotated more to its left side. I know, I didn't pick the names, but the way that I remember it is if they're going in a line to the right, you rotate left. If they're going in a line to the left, you rotate right. You're just sort of counteracting the lean. Yeah. Ooh, good question. Okay, so on duplicates, right now I have not shown you anything with duplicates because we have been living in this world of dictionary. Uh, with AVL trees, usually they could hold a duplicate and it would just be something that shows up at each one of those sort of markers where you're like, oh, am I less than or greater than? you would just pick one of them to have an equal sign underneath it. And people, I think, conventionally do less than or equal to. So like, if I was going to add another six into this tree here after that final state, it would get popped into the left of that six. Any other questions? Cool. Maybe one more real quick one. Um, okay, so here is an AVL tree. Imagine the value 55 is inserted into the AVL tree. Taking a quick look at this, can anyone raise their hand and tell me who becomes 55's parent after insertion and before any rotations? Where does it get popped into on the tree initially? Again, we're just following that BST structure to find where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. 51, and is it to the left or the right? 
to the right. Yes, it is greater than 51. So again, we're sort of following, like, it's greater than 42, I go right. It's greater than 47, I go right. Ooh, it's less than 63, I go left. It's greater than 51, I go right. So it gets popped in there. So now you can imagine I have a 55 hanging out over here. Does that cause an imbalance? Yes, I like that, lots of nods. Which node becomes imbalanced? Yes, yes, yes. The whispers have it. Uh, yes, the 63 becomes imbalanced in this case. But this is not a line case then, this is a kink case. So that would require two rotations. There's more examples in the slide deck. I just wanted to go over that. Cool. OK, great. Thanks, Google Slides. OK, cool. Um, OK, uh, announcements. So a week and a half from today is our first exam. Huzzah. Um, so I, I will share with all of you, I have been changing the format of exams pretty much every time I've taught this class since the pandemic because gosh darn it I just exams suck <laughs> like I hate them you hate them why do we have to do them in school um, so here's where I've landed I used to do this exam at the midterm time where it was almost always this super time crunch because I was like, oh my gosh, I better validate that you can put everything into a hash table and I better validate that you can do all the ABL rotations and I better validate that you can like list all the ADTs and then I just realized like, why am I forcing you to rush through that? That's what your exercises are. So technically I took stuff that previously would have been assessments and I just turned it into your exercises. So you could like do it in the comfort of your own home and ask TAs about it and talk to each other and all that good stuff. So those types of questions where I just sort of give you numbers and you fill out the ADT, that is not the type of question that will be on the exam. I call that out because if you go and look back at any of the past quarters, that's almost what all the exams look like. And I've just decided, I don't know, I don't think that's very interesting to force you to regurgitate in a set hour. But I am going to ask you to think a little deeper than that and do some design work and do some pretty heavy analysis work. But remember that the way that the exams are going to work is we're going to come here on Friday the 28th. Yes, thank you. Uh, so it'll be in class Friday the 28th. Um, luckily, we don't have anyone physically in this room after us. So I will tell you, I'm probably going to start the exam at like 3.35. So y'all can like get here comfortably and feel very like settled before I press start on the 50 minute stopwatch. So we'll really do the exam from like 3.35 to 4.25 or something like that. Um, reminder, it will be a paper exam. So bring a writing utensil of your choosing uh, and you are welcome to have an unlimited amount of paper notes. They must be paper, though. I don't know what to do about ChatGPT, so that's a problem for future KC. Um, so no electronics, but you can bring as much notes as you want. Don't be fooled. That's just a teacher trick, because we know if you don't study and you just bring your whole book, you will run out of time just like flipping through stuff. So if you are somebody who previously was really into making those nice condensed like single note sheets, Actually, there's a bunch of magical value in just making that note sheet. Hot tip for you. OK. Um, these are the topics that I consider to be sort of like within range of this exam. These are the topics that extend from week one through the end of this week. So weeks one through four. Our second exam will be at the end of week nine, and it will be covering weeks five through eight. Um, but the topics we pick up starting next week on Monday and Tuesday, those are not going to be relevant for, for this exam. They will be relevant for the next one. Um, so here's the list. Hopefully they look somewhat familiar, except for maybe those last two in the data structures, because that's what we're going to be learning across sort of like today and Friday. Um, I will tell you that I'm not going to ask you to write code. I think writing code on paper is mostly just an academic thing. Um, so I don't think it makes a lot of sense. But I might have you look at code. 
I am going to have you think about data structures. I am going to have you think about runtime a lot. I am going to think you have you think about case analysis a lot. I am going to have you think about trade-offs between the different data structures. And I will have you justify your answers in sort of like written sentences, very similar to those problems on your exercises. You know how there's like most of your exercise is clearly auto-graded and there's like one question where we have you write something? Surprise, we've been helping you practice for the exam all along. Question. So if you go back in, if you like, well, one, you can always just go back and change the URL. And I'm pretty sure, like, I don't think we've posted past exams for this one because they don't seem super relevant. But I know we just have a whole stock of past exams. The question types will be pretty different. What? Oh, it like exists already? OK, I was like not, I was not going to promise it. But OK, here's what I will tell you. A wonderfully kind TA actually was like, wow, it's so unfair. They don't have a practice exam. I'll write one. And I was like, I'm not going to promise it to them until you actually do it. But I think that there will be a practice exam um, from one of the TAs so you get a sense. But what I would do in order to get a sense for what the exam might look be like is look at those questions on your exercises that have writing portions. Look at the questions from your section handouts that are more designy. And if you want, you can change the URL back to 22 spring. Um, and you can look at all the past exams there, and you want to look at anything that's more design heavy, question wise. Yeah. I will tell you that there are right now two questions with many parts. Yes. We do not generally release the answers for the exercises, because then we would have to write brand new homework assignments every quarter, and we would never be able to do this class, unfortunately. Um, but you will have your grades coming out, I think, for at least the first one, if not the second one, by the time the exam happens, if that helps. If you are at any point unsure, the TAs definitely can tell you the answers. We just can't like post them for homework reusability purposes. Any other questions about the exam, logistics or otherwise? Maybe I should pop open the Slido. Feel free to ask questions maybe on the Slido that feel too spicy to raise your hand for. Oh, there's no questions. OK, cool. Well, if something comes up, please feel free to put it in there. TAs are happy to answer your question. Um, but yeah, if you think anything else comes up, feel, feel free to post questions on the ed board. I'm sure somebody else thought of it. OK. And then, of course, reminder, you've got uh, Project 2 is still out. Uh, it'll be due a week from today. Exercise 3 is out. You will have an Exercise 4 that goes out on Monday. I will tell you, since you only have two lectures next week, and we know you got to study for an exam, the plan is that Exercise 4 will be pretty short. It'll be kind of like three quarters of an exercise in length, as opposed to a full-sized one. And then, of course, remember, uh, we will give you a week to do your resubmission for the exam after you get your grades back. Um, so we're going to take the exam on Friday. Our goal is to have those grades out to you by the following Wednesday. And then you have that Wednesday to Wednesday week to write your resubmissions for your exam. And then we will regrade those, and you can earn up to half of the points you missed back. Um, oh, OK. Uh, these slides in here are a little bit of sort of a review. Um, so things that you should be comfortable with is knowing what the run times are for the different ADT functions as implemented with the different data structures. The one that is probably the most relevant, there's a reason we're kind of like obsessed with dictionaries, is because it's just like the way to store the densest amount of data. Um, so here's some run times. So if you notice, the run times for put, get, and remove are all pretty gosh darn similar because all of them require us finding the key. If I put, I have to call a contains key first to see if there's a duplicate key. Get is the act of finding it. And same thing with remove. I've got to find the things. So you'll find for all three of those dictionary run times, they're pretty identical. Um, and generally, with the array list and the linked list, 
the best case scenario is like, the thing you're looking for is right at the beginning. Convenient, constant time lookup. Worst case is the thing you're looking for doesn't exist. So you have to loop over absolutely everything to make sure it's not in there. Hash tables, we think of hash tables as an in practice runtime of O of one or constant time. Technically, you can have a worst case runtime of that degenerate hash table. But if we ask you for, say, like an in practice runtime of hash table or like you're in an interview um, and somebody asks you what the runtime of a hash table is, you should say constant because it's very statistically unlikely that you'll get that degenerate hash table. Yeah, question. If we say explicitly, like, what is the worst case runtime of hash tables in general? Yeah, it would be O of N. Um, I will tell you, we will give you some pretty explicit scenarios. And we will expect that you look at the scenarios and ask yourselves, is there something about the scenario that would prevent that from happening? But I will say, like, the conceptual idea of hash tables their worst case runtime is, yeah, like n collisions causing a linked list of size n hanging off of one bucket, which would be a linear runtime. Um, and then we've been picking up trees between last week and this one. So binary search trees, the um, best case runtime is for looking for something is constant, like it's sort of hanging out there. Um, the worst case is a BST has no enforcing function. So a BST, I will say, totally can become a degenerate form of itself. Can anyone tell me, like, does the order in which you add things to the BST impact its structure? Yeah, it does. Can anyone tell me what order of adding values into a BST would cause a degenerate BST? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so like ascending values, like if I put one and then I put two and then I put three and then I put four, because a BST doesn't self-balance, what that would happen is like if I started with the value one and then I put the value two, it would go to the right of one, and then the value three would go to the right of two and so on, and so on. And I have a really long, lean, leaning tower of BST. Same thing goes for descending. That's why we've become obsessed with this idea of a balanced tree, and that's where we get to AVL. And so you can see there that it still maintains that sort of like best case constant, but we do get this worst case limit of log n, and that log n comes from the height of the tree. So if it is a balanced tree, then every time we make a decision where we go left or right in a branch, we eliminate half of the possible things we have to examine. If I just do a search over a regular binary tree where I have to just look at every single node, that's essentially like a linear search. If I just recurse left and right, that gives me a linear time. But if I'm like, ooh, if this only recurs left or right, that's when I get that logarithmic runtime. I just wanted to go over that. That's my little midterm exam one, whatever you want to call it, review. Any questions about those sort of run times? Okay, cool. Um, there's some design stuff in here, but I don't think it's particularly interesting for us to go over right now. But you can see some of the things you could ask yourself. I'll say maybe one thing to think about is, um, you can see here how we sort of uh, structured it, like, one, ask yourself, like, which functionality is needed? And then after you know what you need to be able to do, think about within that subset, like, what are you going to choose to optimize for? And so sometimes what you choose to optimize for might be based on your empathy of the user or your lived experience. Also, a delightful possible moment for bias. Is everybody going to optimize for the same functionality that you think you should optimize for? So in this like class gradebook example, maybe we need to be able to add students and add grades and see if a grade's already there and update it and remove and do all that stuff. Then you can see we sort of picked, we're like, oh, maybe adding new grades to the record is something that's gonna happen a lot. Finding a specific grade's gonna happen a lot, so I'm gonna choose those two to be the most common I'm going to optimize for. So think about when you're doing your designs, 
tell us to what aim you are optimizing for. And there's a few different ways to do it. You could optimize to make the most common function the fastest or the least expensive or use the least memory. Or you could optimize to be like, wow, there could be some really bad worst case scenario and I want to optimize to just make sure I never get into that bad scenario. So there's almost like an optimization that's like, oh, I'm trying to like work towards a good runtime for the really common stuff. There's also another way to think about optimizing. We're trying to avoid a really bad case situation. So when you're trying to justify your answers in English, make sure that you explain to us like what you are attempting to optimize for functionality wise and why. How did you come to that conclusion that that was the thing that was important to you? And then the rest of this stuff is just, you can read through it. I'll let you read through it. There we go. Great. Okay. Cool. Oh my gosh, there's more. There you go. You can read these things. Okay. All right. I think let's get back into the land of trees for a little bit. Um, so we need to finish up ABLs. This is sort of we left off on Monday. So these are sort of like the four, really. They're just sort of two cases, but with mirror images. These are the sort of like subset of nodes that cause imbalance. So we saw it in the two warm-ups. There's the line case where we have three things all in the same line, or the kink case where we have three things again, all sort of stemming off of one particular subtree, but that they sort of have a left and a right involved. And so, of course, the thing to remember is that if you are in the line case, that takes a single rotation to resolve. If you are in the kink case, that takes two rotations to resolve. Cool. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about runtime of AVLs. We did a bunch of the logistics. Here's what goes here. Um, but let's talk about the implications of this design. So how long does rebalancing take? So one, the way that we're going to implement these AVL trees is we are going to maintain a height field. And the height of any given node is sort of like the larger of the heights of its two, like, if it's either it's left or right subtree plus one. So if I have a left subtree of height one and a right subtree of height two, I would say, oh, well, two is bigger plus one, my height is three. That's how we get there. So we're going to sort of store a field um, and we will do that sort of comparison. Uh, in the examples we saw in warm up, there was really only one node that became balanced. And then I just had to do some amount of swapping arrows around. And so when I was just interacting with those three imbalanced nodes somewhere in the middle of the AVL tree, that wasn't really based on how many things overall were in the AVL tree. So we think of those rotations as even though there's like a bunch of stuff going on, we do think of them as sort of constant time to do the rotation. They're not negligible, but it's just this sort of like little tax of time that you're going to spend possibly every time you have to refix your tree. It will take log n time though to get any time from the top of the tree to the bottom and every time you insert, you're always going to insert a leaf node. So it's always going to take you logarithmic time to get from the top of the tree down to the bottom of the tree to insert that leaf node. How many, here's a question, we've seen so far a situation where when I add a node, I only really had to like rebalance to like fix that immediate sort of grandparent or parent. It was like there was like one level of imbalance, but there could be recursive cascading imbalances. Can anyone tell me what is like the maximum number of imbalanced nodes that could be caused by any singular insertion into an AVL tree? Like, what's the most number of nodes that could become imbalanced after an insertion? Any instincts? Yeah. Yes, log n. Because if you think of it, we're going to traverse down to the bottom of the tree. We're going to put this node in. And then that imbalance, the most impact it could have is just sort of like back up the levels of the tree. And the levels of the tree, that's always log n. So at 
most cases, at best case, the rotations take constant time. At absolute, absolute worst, you might have log n rotations to do to kind of travel back up the tree. But this operation of insertion already has a factor of log n just to get from the top down to the bottom anyway. So even that worst case number of rotations isn't going to like change the complexity class of the insertion function. Yeah? Cool? I know. I'm sorry. I know this is dry, fun, uh, asymptotic analysis stuff. Great. Um, so yeah. So we think of the put function or the insert function as always having logarithmic time in the AVL tree, even though that logarithmic time might include the time to get from the top to the bottom to the leaf in, uh, logarithmic time to like rebalance all the nodes all the way up, it's still the same complexity class, and that's why we are guaranteed log n is the worst case runtime for any put, any get in an AVL tree. Okay, cool. Um, so we've talked about this, we make a new leaf, um, we know that, yes, like we were just sort of talking about facts that make this easier, imbalances can only really occur along the path of the new leaf to the root, because that's really the only things that are going to be impacted. Like, hopefully you've seen at this point, too, like, whenever we insert something, it kind of leaves half of the tree, like, untouched, no matter what's happening, right? Like, if I insert something to the right, whatever is immediately to the left of the overall root, it's just like nothing there ever really gets moved after we make that change. So we know that the imbalance is really are only going to incur along the path that we traveled to insert our node. Um, we only have to address the lowest unbalanced node, and then we apply the rotation. And so the thing about it is applying a rotation restores the height of the subtree before the insertion. And so actually you'll find that even though like technically we could have these sort of like imbalances up the tree, um, we're pretty much always going to be guaranteed to just have a single rotation, which actually makes the AVL performance really nice. This is all a very long-winded way of Casey saying, gosh darn it, AVL trees have a really nice runtime for a tree. Great, great, thanks. Here is the cons <laughs> of the AVL tree. The AVL tree is notoriously a pain in the booty to implement. You thought linked lists were bad? Okay, now you've got like two references at each level. You've got to do a bunch of swapping. Uh, this is some code I pulled. So here's like insert node where we have to like update the height and then we rebalance. This is the rebalance method. Here you can see it's checking for each of the cases. Here's my node where it's storing the height. But look at all these crazy nested ifs. And then here is the code to rotate left and right, which might look pretty similar to linked list code. You got these like node dot left and node dot right, and you sort of make a temporary and fill them up and all that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, this gets really prickly really fast. So we were not, we will not ask you to implement this code. In fact, I would, and no wait, 332 makes you do it, don't they? Yeah. So you, if you get into the CS major, they will make you do it. Ha ha ha. Enjoy. Um, but yeah, like AVLs are sort of notoriously a pain to maintain, a pain to implement. Java does have an AVL implementation as part of its underlying hash, but I think even tree map in Java doesn't use AVLs because even the makers of Java were like, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So, I just spent all this time convincing you AVLs are so great, and then I told you they're almost impossible to deal with, so can we do better? Oh yeah, delete. I literally didn't even put the code on here because I thought it would terrify all of you. It's really gross. <laughs> um, so pros, all operations have logarithmic worst. Uh, the act of rebalancing is always constant. Asymptotically, it's just better than a normal BST but it is relatively difficult to program and debug. We need some extra space for the height field. Um, rebalancing does take some time. What are some other ways we can rebalance trees? So there's actually a bunch of different approaches. Um, between today and Friday, I'm gonna be taking you through uh, two, three trees and then two left-leaning red-black trees. We'll get to the left-leaning red-black trees, I think, actually on Friday. Um, 
But these are just ways that people have invented specifically to have a self-balancing tree that is easier to implement. That's the entire purpose of these. So um, there's sort of two approaches we're going to talk about here is one, um, ways to maintain balance. We could try to just sort of like condense our tree, like not make as many levels as quickly by storing multiple pieces of information within a single node. We also can use the sort of concept of red, black, where we sort of like specialty color different spaces and we decide how we calculate. I promise we'll get to that. But let's start with this uh, condensing multiple data points piece. Okay, so meet the 2, 3 tree. Uh, the 2, 3 tree stands for the two different types of nodes that you will find within the 2, 3 tree. The two nodes have two children but one data point. That's just like a regular node that you've seen all along. In our 2, 3 tree, this one here is an example where I've got the value 1 stored and then just like an empty bucket. Three nodes are nodes that have two pieces of data but three children. That's where the three comes from. Data is still stored in binary search order and we do maintain height balance. I'm going to show you how we maintain it. But the way that the binary search order works here is see I've got 2 and 9. So everything that is less than 2 goes here to the left. Everything that is between the values 2 and 9, they go here in the middle, in between. And then everything that's greater than 9 goes to the right. I won't get a chance, but there's also, this is technically a type of something called a B tree. Um, if you continue on, there's a lot of use cases for this type of tree where we've sort of got an array of possible children and which child determines where in the sequence of values that are all stored together at that node. This is just a particular style of bee tree. So this is a very common type of tree, but I picked two, three because that's the smallest ones and hopefully the ones that will break your brain the least. Okay, how do we do insertions? So. Just like with the AVL, we are going to insert a value into the leaf node, maintaining the BST ordering property first and foremost. Now, we have to have this idea of concept between a full or not full node. So a node is full if there's already two values stored in it. If there's already two values stored in the node, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of like temporarily place that third value there and then I'm going to take the middle value of the three and I'm going to sort of whoop, 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 percolate it up, if you will. Which is great because if you remember, the runtime is dictated on the height of the tree. And so this is a way for us to sort of like spread the density of data upwards on the tree instead of downwards. So we're not adding extra recursive calls. We're sort of maintaining the runtime. So let's say. I add the value 18. In the BST ordering property, I would be like, 18 is greater than 8, go to the right. Boom. 18 is greater than 14, go to the right. And then I had this like 15, 16 node hanging out here. And so I'm like, oh sweet, 18 would belong there sort of order wise, but I have now overloaded a node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this 16 out. This is called a split. And I'm going to sort of like shift that 16 up to now fit in with the 14. So instead of adding a next layer of this tree further down, I'm sending a little bit more density upwards. And I can do that because I now am going to add whenever I split a node, that also means I need to generate a new child. So that 15 and 18 will now become two separate nodes, and I'm going to store the 15 in between the now newly cemented together uh, three node there. Questions on that? Yes. Ah, yeah, you're right. It probably, it, the, it would have densed itself up. 
Um, I maybe simplified this one a little bit. You could also imagine that I've deleted a couple things. But you're right, that's an excellent point. So that I kind of left this a little sparser than it would have generated naturally if I had just done pure inserts to get to this level. Okay. Why don't you give it a try? Go ahead, try inserting 12 and 13 into the following 2-3 tree. Put them first as leaf nodes. Once you get too big a leaf node, split it, pop the middle value up, and generate now three sort of children hanging off that. Go ahead, chat for like, yeah, two minutes or so. I think the Weiss textbook is terrible. I think it is awful. I think it's terrible Java code. I think Weiss is clearly a C developer. I think it is one of the driest textbooks on the face of the planet. Somebody somewhere should write a data structures and algorithms textbook. Robbie and I talk about it all the time. <laughs> but who's got the time? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like in like 20 years, Robbie and I will be like, we should write that textbook. <laughs> okay, real quick, before the bell rings on us. Uh, okay, let's start with the 12. Can anyone tell me where the 12 is going to go initially in this tree? What is it going to get paired with? Yeah. Right to the right of 10. Absolutely. Can it stay there, or do I need to do anything else to it? It can stay, yeah. There's like space, right? So, boom, I'm out of the 12. Great, I didn't add height. Wonderful. Where is the 13 going to go once I insert it? Yes. Sorry, say it again. To the right of 12, yes, I agree. It will go to the right of 12. So here, you can see, I've now got that 10, 12, 13. But I've got an overloaded node, so which of the 10, 12, 13 is going to percolate up? 12, yes. Uh-oh. Do I need to keep going? Yes, okay. What node is going to percolate up? Yes, I agree, 14, ha-ha. There we go. Look, I've just added two things and I did not extend the height of the tree. Did I do that right? Any questions? Okay, cool, okay. Thank you for your patience. I know this was like a really painfully dry one. We'll do a bunch of fun stuff on Friday with left-leaning rack trees and tries. See you then, team. You think this is worse than a bee tree? I feel like this is so delightfully, I think this is simpler than a bee tree, no? It is, it is literally a type of bee tree, by definition. But yeah, I have a question for you. Sure, sure. Yes, you could technically do that because you're absolutely right. In this case, like it would maintain the binary search property and all that stuff, but these are recursive structures. And so if we always sort of like err on the side of percolating up, that's going to in general prevent us more often from generating more levels. So anytime we start to let ourselves like, oh, this time it'll fit, we can't write the code in that way unless it gets really messy. Um, so that's why we sort of percolate up to try and fill up all of those spots first. So like any chance you get to mirror. Yeah, exactly. Kind of keeps it short and squat, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Good question.